Uh, my name is Jerry Hughes. I am the managing partner of Compass IT Compliance. And uh, I've been doing this um, audit work for a number of years. I'm an IT professional years back, started in the banking industry and running in-house systems and, and did a lot of the work myself, was a developer for a number of years. I tell you this to kind of lay the foundation uh, for, uh, you know, uh, when I start talking about the different industries, um, I worked in several of those from a different capacity or in a different capacity. So we've we got a few things we're going to cover today in our brief 30 minutes or so uh, uh, session. Um, we'll go through a brief introduction uh, regarding the session objectives and things. Going to move through threats and, and some statistics on where we are with some of the, you know, the most prevalent ones that we're hearing and seeing today. And it is an ever-changing landscape that uh, you know, we're all up against. So um, the other thing is then we're going to move into requirements. Um, which will be from the different verticals, right? When we talk about the banking industry, we think of the FFIEC, who governs banking in the United States. And we talk about, uh, I mean, one of the gentlemen was asking me a question, I'm a qualified security assessor for PCI. So we do audit work in, in all uh, industries, okay? So we're gonna cover a lot of good stuff there. I'm gonna use some good examples so it uh, kind of resonates with you. I am going to cover from a different perspective a little bit, though. I'm going to share with you folks, you know, the, obviously the threats, which is what gets the ball rolling. And in response to these threats, laws come out to protect consumers. And uh, so we're going to cover some of that. I'm going to use some, some audit ease, if you will. I'll define some of the terms for you. But I want you to be able to take away some, th some things from this, uh, this session. I mean, at least uh, understanding of, of, of some of the uh, bigger threats and maybe some of the bigger things that you can do in your business to mitigate or to minimize some of those risks. Um, I'm gonna share the tools um, that we, we utilize for a lot of uh, the work that we do in the different industries. And uh, I'll take questions along the way and at the end for sure. So if you look at it, uh, organizations face complex compliance challenges in, in today's business environment. You know, depending, not, even if it's not banking, you look at the healthcare industry, you look at new laws that are coming out like GDPR. You guys heard of GDPR? It's, it, yeah, we've, we presented on it and we do risk assessments for organizations, kind of getting them since May 25th when it went live, trying to get them in, 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 uh, you know, in a better place, if you will. Uh, all of these, though, all of these, whether they're laws, guidelines, or best practices, we're looking at kind of the same thing. And, and I'll walk you through that. But really, it's understanding where your data is and what kind of data you have. Classifying that data so you understand how to protect it. Okay, and then we're going to show you some of the, the Qualys tools that we utilize, uh, you know, and with great success. I do want to take a moment to thank Qualys, great business partner for years. Thank you for having us at this conference. It's always a great time, and thank you, folks, for attending this session. Uh, if you have questions after, because this is brief, I can go on and on. I promise you that. Okay, so. So let's kind of move through it a little bit. Our goal was like to give you kind of, again, you know, w walk you through a little bit of the threat landscape that's changing. But think about this for a second, too. It's not just that, uh, that new threats are coming out every day, but, but it's also that your business is changing. So even once you get your controls in place to protect and reduce risk in your businesses to reasonable levels, there's some new threat coming out. And they're coming in at a feverish pace. Uh, most utilize technology to a fair degree. Some of them are our social engineering attacks that involve the human element. And uh, so there's a lot, a lot of things to look at. We're gonna cover, we're gonna cover a little bit of these uh, in, this, in a brief time and kind of share with you a little bit of, of the experiences that we've had with the clients that we do work for. So looking at the threats and some of the stats here are crazy. These sites, I listed a few of these up here, uh, like uh, Curbs on Security, also US CERT and SANS.org. Everybody knows these sites. They list uh, uh, you know, uh, different threats as they're emerging. We get that out to our clients to kind of educate them. Because one of the things you're gonna see when I, when I walk through some of these slides here, it's like you know, we, we think about uh, you know, building up and strengthening our infrastructure and making sure we've got you know, the best, uh, best of breed and we've got things secured. At the end of the day, you've got people behind there running, running the business for you, which is a necessity. And it can be, uh, it can be a risk as well if it's not properly uh, governed or, or properly set up. So, so your folks in your business can be a threat, but they also, with great security awareness, education can be one of your strongest assets. Okay, so looking at these, the, the threats and the stats here, it's, it's kind of nuts if you look at uh, you know, the number of new threats. They're 
uh, Kibros, or Kaspersky rather, put out stats on this and from 2017. There was like 360,000 a day, which is nuts. Um, it, it's just growing. It's, it's growing. I, I really didn't even think I needed to kind of go into scare tactics or come out with stats. But, uh, but honestly, if you look at these different, these are the top five. And there's different lists that you'll see out there. I'm not going to argue which is more risky. But, but these are up there, right? Malware consisting of ransomware, which is what gets the press now, right? Everything's in the front paper with ransomware attacks. And, you know, Trojans and Worms are different types of malware that are utilized in, in all businesses, uh, unfortunately. So there's no uh, business that's not being at least um, targeted from different perspectives, sometimes from inside and sometimes from, from the internet. Um, some of the other ones, and number two frustrates me more than anything, and this is where your scanning is gonna come in, in handy here, unpatched security vulnerabilities. A lot of these threats that you see that come out that are well known, some of them came out from old uh, systems that OSs that weren't uh, properly patched um, you know, hard, hardware that's not, you know, has old firmware on it, has been updated. I mean, some of these things are frustrating. Uh, Verizon puts out a, a pretty slick list. It, we use it in the PCI world, but it really is more broad than PCI. But they list every year the, the compromises, right, relative to the data security standard. And up in the top two or three, every year is not changing default passwords on, on perimeter devices and things. I mean, it's just a 101. So when we go in as auditors, we're looking for controls in your environment that start with your policies, right? So manage its policies to govern different areas of your business and, and, and looking to see that you have a vulnerability management program is, is huge. Uh, I'll give you a quick definition, really, because I'm going to use the word program a few times. The difference between a program and, and, say, a policy is this. A program like your security program or a vulnerability management program is comprised of policies, let's say the do's and don'ts. Those are in there are the control statements that we auditors are looking for. In there, you might read in a vulnerability management one, you might read something like, you know, we will you know, scan our infrastructure for vulnerabilities. You know, I got a lot of clients that are doing it monthly. I think it's great. Uh, minimum would be quarterly, but, but uh, they're, they're in their policies, they are literally, that is a control statement. And then we audit them to that, measure the results. Are they, are they doing that? Uh, and then also when vulnerabilities are identified, what are you doing? What kind of timeline? What are you gonna do with the high vulnerabilities versus the low ones? How are you going to attack those and mitigate those risks to, to minimize the damage to your business. So, so there's a lot to consider, but think about the program as all of it. It's the policies, procedures, the training, and then the ongoing monitoring using tools like QualisGuard. Phenomenal, and God bless you whoever sneezed over there. <laughs> all right, social engineering, this is a fun one. We, I mean, different angles and different attacks every day. We, we do a lot of phishing uh, for our clients and then we attack ourselves, which is kind of fun because I, I, as an owner and, and my business partner um, also, we, we don't want to know when we're doing it. I want everybody tested in my business and then we do it for our clients and it's, it's eye-opening, but we are uh, doing great because we teach it and we, and we uh, you know, train folks on you know, how to avoid and what to kind of look for. It's not a lot of hard stuff. It's, it's common sense things. If you didn't know this source of the email, don't click on it. If you weren't expecting something, how long does it take now to send a text to somebody or instant message from within your business? Just take the extra step, that's all. So you look at social engineering, there's different ones there. Pretext is where you call up and misrepresent who you are to get a little bit of information, a little bit more. These are and have been around uh, forever and they're, they're constantly evolving. As we come up on the holiday season, you're gonna see a boatload of these, right? UPS ones, Amazon ones, all kinds of things like that. It just, uh, you know, you just can be smart about it. Don't click on things, don't provide information. This is how you introduce viruses to your, into, onto your system and potentially to your network. The uh, Internet of Things, this is more and more uh, prevalent right now. There's a case uh, going on right now where I think Amazon Dot was just uh, subpoenaed to get the, uh, the recordings. They may have recordings on there of a murder that took place. These devices are all through many houses, you know, Nest, Amazon. They got, they've got a lot of great devices to automate things, to, uh, you know, to, to allow, you know, quick ways of, of, of managing your home and things of that nature. But on the other side of it, you know, it's up in the cloud and these are access points. And if people introduce these devices into your business network, even if it's not a malicious intent, it doesn't matter. It's a point to jump off of. It's a point to a potentially a vulnerability that you've, you've brought onto the system, onto the network and exposed your business to. So those are, those are big things and policies need to be in place to properly govern this and to minimize what's going on, um, you know, the risks and such. I mentioned the employee thing. I will say that they listed it like this as one of the bigger threats, and, and, that, and that's true, but I'll turn it around on it and I'll say, look, in every one of the, the, the areas 
uh, that I'm going to show you in a minute with the different verticals, whether it's banking and we look at the FFIC requirements or whether it's just even a best practice or, or some of the guidelines through SANS Institute, um, you know, you're going to see where security awareness training is a mandate. I mean, it's, it's, it's just makes sense. Keeping it in front of your folks and not just the one and done, check it off my list. I did the training this year, it's done. I got that out of the way. You know, we need to have it ongoing, right? It's gotta be in your face uh, so that you're seeing at least quarterly new messages and reminders to do this, do that. And honestly, the biggest thing there, number one takeaway is if something doesn't seem right, raise your hand, ask somebody in IT, let's take a look at it. When, when, when things like this, if you educate your, your team properly, they can, they can be one of your best defenses. Someone's going to make a mistake. People will be people. They're going to click on a link. They're going to open an email. They're going to do stuff like that. But if they realize it, if they act upon it quickly, and we isolate these systems, we bring IT in to isolate, and then we minimize the risk immediately. So when we train staff, I first ask if the industry uh, or, or the business that I'm working with, if they're pretty technical, I feel comfortable going in and saying, look, guys, you don't want to necessarily kill the, the system, you lose your footprint, you lose what's in memory, you lose your digital forensics information that could be in there, could be a key to identifying at least if information left the building or not. You may not get to the bottom of that, but you won't if you power down and kill things. So we train, if they feel like their staff's IT savvy, we'll, we'll educate them a little bit so they can they understand, I'm gonna take the you know, ethernet cable out and I'm gonna shut down my Wi-Fi. I'm now an island bring in a digital, we do digital forensics, there are a lot of good firms out there to do it, and you know, isolate it, maintain chain of custody, and attack. And here's why that's so important. If we are able to determine that nothing left the facility through a digital forensics investigation, you have no legal obligation to notify anything, anybody of any kind of potential compromise. That's huge. You think about the damage to a business. It's not just pure dollars and cents for a penalty or this or that. Reputational damage is probably one of your biggest damages, depending on the industry you're in. You can't lose the confidence in your business uh, uh, you know, from, your, from your customers, right? You gotta maintain that confidence ongoing, get ahead of it, train your staff, and then train them again and keep doing it. Big item. Okay, so the requirements, right? So we, let's put it in, in context, right? The, you know, we're, we're doing some things. A lot of times what happens is this. We got good business opportunities. You know, you're a smaller company. You want to compete with some of the bigger players. So you want to offer awesome tools for, for quick, you know, transactions and delivery of service. And, and it's great. It's very exciting. It really is. It's an auditor nightmare when we take things and move them right into production without testing, right? So, so if it's an application, let's do a scan on it. Let's do it, you know, maybe even a code review, depending on what the nature of the application is. What platform is it on? Have we, have we interrogated that environment properly? So let's, let's get this stuff to market, but let's first assess. Let's do a risk assessment. Let's, let's run a vulnerability scan of the, of the environment, of the network. Let's make sure the OS is patched. Let's make sure that we're starting off on the right foot, right? So, so just being smart about it. But, but when folks go to market fast and they don't prepare like that, what happens is that we get compromises left and right. It's in the news. You can't miss it. It's, there's, it's in your face. And then what comes out are laws, right? laws in response to it. You're going to see a major change. I will say GDPR took a lead on some of this. The California state law was just passed. Very similar. I mean, a ripoff of, of GDPR, if you will. It is intense and it's going to get more intense and it's going to go, uh, it's definitely going to spread through states. The most aggressive states, California, when I say aggressive, I mean in terms of, uh, of protecting consumers, right? Privacy and security, they're, they're pretty much really good. They le they're leading edge on that. So you'll see a lot of laws come out of California first. So California, over here on the East Coast, way over on the East Coast where I'm from, the state of Massachusetts, they're also very aggressive. Mass 201 CMR 17 is a law on privacy for consumers. And you see other states like Texas, th th those are also very aggressive. New York also has legislation and laws passed, again, at the state level for the protection of consumer information. This is a common thing. This isn't going away. And the way to get your arms around it, it starts with, like I said, first before, was just first start with, where is my data? What kind of data do I have? Where is it? Right? I always tell clients, so we're going to go into banking in a second, but I always tell clients this, like, look guys, it's just two dimensions here. One is physical and the other is logical. So physically, let's, let's get a, a, a diagram of your campus, right? Here's my facility, here's my office. Oh, I have a third party uh, service provider over here. I have this and let's take a red marker and flow the traffic, uh, you know, of physical documents or physical servers where PII, personally identifiable information resides. You can change the acronym. If we're talking about PCI, it's PCI. Want to talk about healthcare? Let's call it EPHI, PII. Let's go, you know what I mean? The bottom line is it doesn't matter what it is. If it's confidential information, you need to know where it is. If it's your customer's information they've entrusted you in, you need to know where it is. And with GDPR, you need to have the ability to provide it to them also to redact it. 
Uh, so there's a lot that's coming down the line, and it's going to be along those lines. So there's, for some of my clients, they're having uh, you know, a lot of you know, redoing infrastructure to be able to support the necessity to turn that on a dime, to redact content that you know, the consumer, in this case, the European Union uh, resident, wants to, uh, to remove. Uh, and, you, and you've got to comply with that. And there's, there's strict regulations on that. So going through, uh, you know, the banking industry, they have 11 or 12 uh, executive handbooks that the uh, examiner handbooks, rather, that they utilize when they go into financial institutions to, to examine them. If you kind of blow through these, I had it highlighted, but when they redid my slide, it was not in there. But the bottom line is, go through it. Risk assess the controls. It's ongoing, you know, not limited to just patch management. Basically, you're ongoing monitoring. You get your quality scans going internally, externally, at least quarterly. I, we, we recommend it monthly, but at least quarterly. And stay up on those. Why? Because they're going to be your quick insight to, to easy to fix vulnerabilities that you otherwise would, may, may not know about. Okay? So stay up on that. That's a, that's a huge one. Kind of blowing through this stuff, we've got uh, the healthcare stuff we talked about. You know, that's been around since in the late 90s there and, and later got teeth when, when uh, Obama passed the uh, Reinvestment Recovery Act with high tech and, and, and introducing more technology into the, into the mix. But basically what, what it did more than anything was put teeth in HIPAA where it was $25 a record if you were compromised. And now uh, there are funds for each of the states, Attorney General's office to Im implement and enforce uh, high tech and, and HIPAA's obviously the base of that. So, so we finally got legislation to, to enforce uh, controls around important information like your healthcare information. This is the GDPR one I talked about. You're going to see it. You're going to see it. And you're going to see a lot more of it. A lot of the cases, this is going to evolve. If you guys ever read this, uh, the law, the full part of the law there, it is crazy. Half of the stuff isn't completely defined yet, though it's in effect now. So as it plays out in court, that's where precedent will be set. So it's kind of hard to get your arms around it yet. But if you said, Jerry, what's the one takeaway for this that I need to think about? And I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. It, it really goes beyond just GDPR. Where's my, where's my information? Where's my confidential information on my consumers? Maybe, maybe my business, uh, you know, our secret sauce is our code and we've developed, that's our business. We develop software, intellectual property, put that in the mix. Take your confidential information, your, your intellectual property, your consumer information of the clients that you serve. Know where it is. I was talking about the two dimensions, physically, and then logically, grab a network diagram, where it flow the traffic. And that, and that is your scope. That is what I got to control. So know where it is first. I get people to say, come on in. No, I don't get time for all this mapping and, and assessing. Let's, I, I need the audit. Let's get an audit done right here. It's like, well, first, we got to understand the scope of the audit, right? How do you start without scope? So I need to understand where your data is to a, a, a fair degree. We need to look at network diagrams. We need to whiteboard a little bit. We need to understand your environment. And everybody's is different. So that's a, that's a big item. That's a big basis for getting your arms around this. So know it and classify it. Real quick note on classification. Simple. There's, there's the government's version of it, which is very intense at the data level. I recommend take a step back. Have a policy at least with maybe four levels. Public information. It's marketing information. I want the world to see it. That's, you know, that's public. And the way I would map this, by the way, look at my network diagram. Maybe look at my VLANs or my subnets and, and say, okay, this segment is public. Everybody has at it. It's out in the DMZ and we're cool with that. This one over here is in the private network. You know, this is you know, internal information. It might not have any consumer information, but it's got our email server and you know, there's, there's, there's internal information I don't want people seeing. So public is the marketing stuff. Internal is sort of email between colleagues. You shouldn't be sending confidential information unless you have secure email anyway. So that's why kind of that's internal. Then the big band, the next level of classification is that uh, confidential information. And the fourth band I always put in is, is restricted. And that's really like a business is looking in, to, to acquire another business. We're merging, we're going public, we're, that only a couple of people in the business know about. And so it's, a, it's secured in a little bit different way. But what a, what a data classification policy will do for you, it, it will tell you when you read it, how once classified, how it should be protected, how the data should be protected at rest and in motion. It's that simple. At rest and in motion, physical and the logical world. Take care of both. PCI, my favorite. So as a QSA company, we are all over and we see some scary things. I, I love my clients and I'll tell you what, I think I've seen it all and I see something new and I just, I, it's, it's fun though. I love going in, finding, you know, let's look at the risk. Let's understand, uh, you know, where, where their risk is, how they can mitigate those risks. They go back in, we'll give them some ideas of how they can fix it. They fix it, we'll retest it. 
But you know, uh, PCI has got several sections. 11 is the biggest uh, that requires uh, ongoing vulnerability, okay? So on ongoing vulnerability management. They're requiring scans, and they just upped the ante on February 1 for service providers. So service providers need to go through and perform uh, penetration testing twice a year now. They used to only have to do it once. They have to do it twice a year now for internal penetration testing. Uh, external still once a year. For the vulnerability assessments, it's quarterly, external, and then internal quarterly as well. And uh, again, we use PolisGuard for that, been phenomenal. There's a new uh, VM in the box that we utilize. I'm gonna cover a little bit on the tools side of it. Tell you what, if you sat in some of these other sessions, pretty amazing. Some of the new stuff, I, I was like, wow, that's coming out, this is out already. Very exciting. Take a look at those, see how you can fold those potentially into your environments. All right, yeah, moving along. SANS top 20, this is, I say fairly new, but getting more traction, CIS. And all it was is they kind of got together, a few groups got together and developed this 20 critical security controls. And as an auditor, real quickly, controls, I keep using that word, right? I use controls, I use risk. It's very simple. Controls are utilized, and by the way, they take the physical form in a policy. You know, like I said, my vulnerability management policy says I will scan monthly or quarterly, whatever. I'll perform internal vulnerability assessments, and if I have any findings, four or five or greater, I will remediate those findings within a reasonable, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's a control statement. It takes place, it lives in policies usually. It can be in procedures as well, but typically that's where it is. So, so, so controls, that's a control statement. I test you to it. Are you doing your scans? I am, I am not. That's a gap, that's a risk. You're not performing the, the uh, scans that you said you would, and, and that is a uh, risk. So, so we mitigate risk by putting controls in. That's, that's as easy as it goes. And I was listening in the last session, someone was asking about risk appetite and things like that. And, Tell you what, uh, it depends on, there's no straight silver bullet answer for that. You can have two businesses, very, very similar businesses, and, and, and their risk appetites can be dramatically different. There are a lot of factors that go into that. Um, but anyway, going through, those are some of the requirements. Now let's look at some of the tools for the, um, uh, yeah, we got, we got time, right? Good. So let's look at some of the tools. So we uh, mentioned the vulnerability assessments that our team does. We have a security group that, that runs all these tools. I, I do, that on the, I'm on the, the IT audit side, so we do the, you know, for, for PCI, we do the report on compliance audits, and my security team uses these great tools, uh, the Qualys portal, um, which is phenomenal. So we've got um, folks setting those up, easy setup. If, if you guys have used it before, you know exactly what I'm talking about, I'm preaching to the choir. If you haven't, I recommend you try out, they have a free, version out there online, you can use I think 30 days, whatever. Take a look at it, you will not be disappointed. We, we tested this tool years ago, Qualys, and they've, they've come a long way anyway, but, but we tested this one, we put it up against, uh, I think it was Cathedral and another product, Rapid7's product. Differences, some good, some bad, I'm not slamming them, but I'll tell you what, we came back to this product for ourselves and our clients because of the improvements, the quality of it, but the service was, was, was far better than we got with those other true organizations. And for me, that goes a long way and for my clients. So, so when you're making those decisions, take a deep dive at that and ask some questions. I think you'll be pleased. So the vulnerability assessments, you know, we're utilizing this few options, like I mentioned. We have, you know, there's a U1 appliance that we stack in there for some clients that want the ongoing, but there's also uh, virtual, we can, you know, uh, the internal personal edition. They got this new five by five box. Have you guys seen that yet? Is anybody using that? Pretty slick, small. So we're using that now in, uh, in a lot of places. You are? Oh no, you're just waving, okay, how you, how you doing? Uh, so uh, yeah, so we got that, right? And then uh, uh, internal, so that's the addition we use there. Then VM, so Qualys is a virtual machine. You can install it on anything. You know, you can put it anywhere, quick to spin up to get going. And I, again, I, we use it. I, I don't run it myself, I had before, but a layup to set up, you know, and, and to go through. And, and, and this ties in so nicely with knowing where your data is. You can't run a scan on your environment unless you know what you're scanning. Where, 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 where do I care about my whole thing? Maybe you do, but maybe I care first to start with because you probably don't have unlimited budgets. Most of my clients don't. And, and so let's focus on the high risk areas. Everything we do should be risk based. That's the world I live in. I know I, know I drive my wife crazy with that, but risk based. I, I weigh risk every day. I do it automatically. I don't mean to sometimes, but you know, let's look at that. Let's see where the high risks are and let's, let's try to mitigate those. Let's get ahead of those because there's going to be a new one down the, down the pike soon. So, so doing that, running this scanner both internally and externally is, is phenomenal in, in identifying um, these threats. It is for them as well, a, a changing uh, you know, landscape as well. A lot of the vulnerabilities that you see out there, the malware, they're just tweaking it and coming back at you from a different angle. Some of it, it, it had been used in, in different versions uh, uh, in the past. And so, so they're changing the footprint slightly of it and the way it attacks. And you know, so these folks are, are looking to stay, uh, stay up on it and they do a great job with that. So, so running, using the scanners, setting those up like that, uh, paramount. 
Qualys also has the uh, capability to run the web app scanning. And if you looked at part of the PCI and, and, and the other regulations, if I'm standing up a web app that's critical, in, in the banking world, critical means uh, anything with you know, transa uh, transacting confidential information, financial information, you know, either one of those is considered a critical transaction. And so, so the way we look at those uh, transactions or those, uh, those systems that are most critical, we, we want to do everything we can, right? So we'll, we'll run a web app pen test against uh, these apps. We, we interrogate the developers if it's off the shelf versus homegrown. There's a lot of things we look at uh, for application uh, controls and such too. So also, in one of the, this is from one of my uh, geek guys from the security side, Qualys leverages the Selenium scripting technology to easily log in to web apps and allow the scanner to kind of spider through. So basically, it's crawling your web pages. And we, you know, ours, we have a bowl, how many we got? That's my marketing director right here. How many we have? How many web pages? 250, and, and we just, you know, and it, you guys probably have a thousand uh, for Qualys, and you know what I mean? So, so, so set it, forget it, go in, it will crawl and, and, and test the, uh, the pages. There's one more tool I wanted to mention. This is one, you know, SSL, um, uh, and early TLS was uh, compromised. The TLS was compromised way back, and PCI and other industries reacted to it, right? We need to get rid of, you can't, you should not allow browsers to use TLS 1, don't support it, or 1.1 even, that was compromised with the Poodle um, uh, virus. So, so 1.2 uh, is the one that folks are using. This tool's phenomenal. It, it's, you, you put it out there, and let me show you what it looks like. You put it out there, I, I blacked it out, but you put it out there, you put the URL, you know, whatever, compassitc.com, put that out there, run it. It will give you a rating. This, this isn't us. We were an A, by the way. Uh, this is a, a good example. I, I brought this one because um, on the second page, the other thing it does is it'll show you what protocols are accepted. So, so they'll tell me, no, we, uh, no, no, we don't allow that. You know, PCI says you got to have 1.2. We, we just support it. And then I look over here and I go, yeah, but 1.0 is still highlighted and, you know, things like that. So, so it's, it's an easy technical fix. It's more of a business challenge to tell your clients you're just not going to accept it. So their browser is not going to work. You're going to give them a link to a new, you know, circa 2018, uh, God forbid the update. Uh, but but that's, that's the kind of thing. It has other information, valuable. Uh, I jumped to, to the chase on this one because we, we use that for, you know, all of our PCI clients would jump in just to do a quick check, make sure uh, on all their uh, public facing sites um, that they're doing it. So kind of walk through a summary. I've got a little bit less than 10 minutes here, um, kind of summarizing things. You know, the threats are coming in everywhere, but even if they weren't, your business is changing, right? You guys, are, you know, if you say it's static, you'd be out of business. Your competitors are looking at the newest, best way, new delivery channels. Why? Because the consumer is saying, hey, I want to bank at night. I want to do this. I want to be able to push a button and get an Uber out front. I want to be able to, everything's on the phones now. Faster transactions, you know, 24 by 7 by 365. No argument there. Technology's going that way fast. I just recommend you slide an order in. You don't have to be geeky like me, but you can get another, slide them in there, take a look at, assess your environment, make sure before you roll this great thing out that you got your controls in place. It doesn't, doesn't delay it that much, and it gives you at least a confidence level when you implement it. So business is not static. We go through the threats. They're, they're changing. And again, once, once a, you know, there's an exploit, and, you know, consumers are complaining about the exploit, and information's been abducted and, re and used, and this is ongoing, then laws come out, and you see more of it. And, and always, always, when laws come out, they, the pendulum swings so far, right? It goes way out, like GDPR. Some of the stuff they're saying, crazy. No way to govern it, even if it was doable. No way to govern it properly. So they came out and threw some stuff against the wall. Some of it will stick, some of it won't. We're going to keep our eye on it, and uh, we, we update our clients on it as well, but, but it's going, some stuff is going to court now, and we're going to see how it plays out, because it is the window for what's happening in California now, and that, as that's being uh, unrolled, or rolled out, rather, uh, other states are, are taking a look at it. So, so that's definitely worth um, looking at. That's, they can hear me? That's great. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. I expect you guys to outdo those guys. I mean, come on, you have pride in yourself, please. All right, so staff education, big one, right? Ongoing, not the one and done checklist. There's, there's two things I always talk to my clients about. You know, there's, there's, there's security, right? So, so you, you look at things, there's compliance and security. I can, I can be compliant, but I'm not necessarily as secure as I could be. I like to focus on, on, on security. Let's, con, let's control the environment, understand where the data is, properly protect it in ongoing, ongoing, uh, on an ongoing fashion. Let's, let's assess it and keep sh making sure the ship stays straight. That, that's security. Oh, by the way, you do that, you're compliant. And it just makes, just makes sense. So going through, educate, educate, do those quarterly internal external scans. Also the pen testing, you know, service providers has been ramped up on, they gotta do it twice. But, but even doing it in one internal and one external pen test, 
uh, I think is huge, not on every IP or every device in your environment. Let's know where, because remember, we know how to map the flow in motion and at rest. So we know where, where our data is. And, and from that, we're going to control it. We're also going to assess it to understand the threats around it. So bringing it home, we've got, um, you know, semi-annual internal pen tests. I tell you that, that some of that's changed. The ongoing vulnerability management. And don't be just compliant, be secure. So I've got about five, four to five minutes here. I'd love to take questions. You, sir. Um, so is there a location, like if I'm trying to build my security standards, I want to know what, what are the different types of data that's out there that's considered sensitive? And where are all the regulations? It's hard to like scour the internet. Yeah, it, right. So, so you need to start with, I don't know if you folks can hear the question, but like, you know, where would I go to see what is truly PII, right? What is, I would first start with what does your, you don't have to tell me now, but what does your business do? Ask yourself, what do we do? Okay, what kind of a business are we in the healthcare industry, the banking industry? What do we do? And then understand, again, physically, logically, where it all is. Start with that. And then we'll look at the data you have. And, 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 and it's changing, by the way. My answer today is different than it was three years ago. Name and address together now, I have been considered PII. And it wasn't before, it, it, you know, because some people don't want their, their address published. So, so if you attach a name to, to an address, it's gone to court. I'm telling you, I know you're looking at me like, really? Yeah, it, it has. It's crazy. But, but uh, name associated with address. Name associated with... So it's, it's data combined also, right? I can have a credit card number, no name, don't know where it lives. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an infraction from PCI's perspective, but really tough to kind of capitalize on. You don't know the zip code. You don't know the name of the person. You don't have the content that you, ha you, you, know, you need. You have some of it. But combine that with a name. Combine this with... So it's, there's no direct answer. Start with your business. See what you have, and I can talk to you offline if you want. But there's, there, there, there are some good definitions there. It's, it, the easy answer is if it's information that you can uh, you know, legally obtain on the internet, legally obtained, that's the key part to it, then it's, it's public information, that's okay. But if it's, if it's uh, you know, not easily obtainable, legally obtainable, then, then it's, it's not, right? So it's kind of, you know, and we can go through a bunch of different scenarios. Anybody, sir, please. How much should you be sharing with your auditor? I've always been... How much should you be yeah. sharing with your auditor? I was always told, you know, if they ask you what the weather, if you know what the weather is like outside, you say yes. Yeah. You know what? Good, good point. So the answer is you share everything. No, I'm kidding. No, no. Hey, look, here, here's what it is. Um, so we sign, we sign an NDA with our clients. We are insured through the eyeballs, that, thanks to PCI and also uh, the digital forensics that we do. Insurance is like through the roof. So my point is, Businesses like ours, you know, vet the, 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 the auditor you're going to go through, right? Make sure they've got the uh, bonded, they're insured uh, to cover the uh, errors and omissions and, and more, uh, as well as, but, but in the area that we're at, you really should answer the question that's asked of you, right? So I'll ask my clients, we give a big list of evidence requested, then we interview. So answer the questions. You know, here's why. Your deceit or lack of sharing of information, you have a control sitting there that we could have talked about. And I would say, look, guys, we're kind of partners on this, right? Let's, if I see something, you know, it's like saying, look, I might have another building that I never told the auditor about. Well, good for you. you. You're not because now we're not even looking at that one. I didn't know that was your property. How would I know it's on another campus? The point is, it, 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 that's why you're seeing now attestations. And every one of these audits, I'm signing off and you're signing off that you would full disclosure. So, so really focusing, answering the questions. There was another question over here someone had. Sir. For the vulnerability you guys found for client, uh, some are patchable, some are not patchable. So what do you guys recommend for the client for the non-patchable vulnerabilities? Okay, so remember when I talked about the great support from Qualys? We've had, so if you're running, like for example, if it's an ASV approved scanning vendor scan for PCI, it is completely binary, it is pass-fail. And, and so literally there'll be an attestation that says pass if the vulnerabilities were, uh, you know, re the risk was low, you know, that kind of thing. If there is one that's identified, it may be a false positive, right? So you've got to demonstrate and provide evidence to them. They'll go through market, rerun, get a clean scan. If there is truly a vulnerability, the term compensating controls, that we're winding down, right? We have yeah, so the, the answer to that is, I, if I have a client that has a situation like that, I'm looking at compensating controls, right? If it's a business system, and we get a lot of people with legacy systems out there that have constraints, and that may be what you're talking about, it might be an older system. What other controls can we put in, the aggregate of which is greater than or equal to the initial control objective, right? So I said a lot of words, a little audit ease, but the point is, what other things can we do? Well, maybe we're, maybe we're also, you know, we're running scans extra, we're looking at things, maybe we also have isolated that subnet completely by itself, physically and logically. Okay, now I reduce the risk. Because I always turn it around to people and say, look, 
You tell me what to do. Take a step back. What could I do if I went rogue? Like, what if I, what's the worst thing I could do? If I can go in there by myself and bang out some stuff, I don't have good separation of duties. I need to maybe separate some of the access so there's, there's checks and balances. And at the very minimum, I need to have uh, a way of detecting after the fact. Preventative controls are great. Detective controls, at least you can identify something after. And the lady in the back? Uh, quick question. So is that a tool or something that will help cross-map controls from different frameworks, right? So there will be an overlap of uh, controls. See, I'm talking about ISO 27000 and NIST 800. So yes. is there a tool that you, you have come across? There are some good ones that are mapped. Yeah, there are some very good ones that actually, and some of them are just tables, right? They've, they've mapped. Exactly. Uh, if you Google it and you look like, um, we belong to ISACA, that's the CISA that we have, you know, and they're pretty good about it, right? They'll map controls, like oh, his, you know, his COVID 5.0 mapped next to PCI DSS 3.2.1, mapped to FFIEC, you know what I mean? They'll literally, there's tables out there. We have some that we, we use when we go in and audit different environments, because you like to think Excel that there's only- Excel sheets are present, but I'm looking for a tool that will help me uh, present a report. Yeah, we, we, there's a partner of ours that we utilize called Quantivate, it's a vulnerability management tool that's an online excellent tool. You're going through and you literally are identifying your controls and uniquely enumerating your controls. You're mapping those to the different you know, standards or laws in your, in your particular area. So for some people it's like, yeah, I've got, I'm in the banking world, so I've got this FFIC stuff, access controls, physical, logical, da, 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 all the way down the list, map to banking. Oh, they also have debit cards. That means PCI, let me map it to that too. So these controls, you map these, so some of them are, you test it once, but I've covered it for PCI and, and banking. Banking. So Quantivate, uh, my marketing director is here. He can give you some information. It's not the only tool around. There's a lot of them out there. You know, that's one that we've had success with. Thank you, folks. Paulus, thanks again. It's here for those guys. A great conference.